The coverage of the Honduran coup has been dominated by a focus on the acts of individuals. Micheletti, Obama, Clinton, Chavez, and above all, ousted President Manuel Celaya. But with only seven months remaining in his presidency, and legally banned from re-election, is it Zelaya that pushed the Honduran political and military elite to carry out a coup? In testimony before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, lobbyist Otto Reich joined the chorus of those pointing to Zelaya's relationship with Hugo Chavez as justification for the coup. Reich is best known for his active role in the U.S. State Department's sponsorship of the attempted coup against Chavez in 2002. Many Hondurans insist that these actions saved democracy by preventing Celaya from establishing the kind of 21st century socialism that is being established in countries of Latin America under something called the ALBA, an alliance invented, invented by Castro and financed by Chavez. La campaña anti-chavista es una campaña absurda, mentirosa. ¿Por qué? Porque Petrocaribe y el ALBA fueron aprobados por el mismo Congreso que destituyó a Celaya. Entonces, si ellos no estaban de acuerdo con las políticas del gobierno venezolano, discúlpenme que lo diga, pero ¿qué diablos fueron a aprobar el ALBA y fueron a aprobar Petrocaribe? Entonces, si, si vamos a aplicar aquí el fantasma chavista, entonces digamos que también el Congreso Nacional que destituyó y que dio golpe de Estado a, al presidente Zelaya también es chavista. The de facto president himself, Roberto Micheletti, voted in favor of ALBA's ratification only eight months ago. At that same time, Celaya was openly supporting Micheletti in the race for the Liberal Party presidential candidacy, a race Micheletti would eventually go on to lose. Officially, the Supreme Court of Honduras ordered the military to remove Celaya from power for attempting to extend the current four-year presidential term limit. Under Article 239 of the Honduran Constitution, the mere mention of repealing the term limit carries an immediate removal from any government position and a 10-year suspension from returning to political life. While there has been no evidence presented that Celaya ever planned to change that limit, Micheletti, on the other hand, is known to have made an attempt to do so almost 24 years ago. This article, from October 1985, under the title Havoc in the Congress, shows Micheletti as one of the 12 members of Congress to sign a motion to legalize the repealing of term limits. If it wasn't about Chavez or term limits, why overthrow Zelaya so close to the end of his rule? Zelaya was removed from power hours before what would have been the first ever popular consultation in Honduran history. In order to gauge support for having the Honduran people write their own constitution, to replace the one written in 1982 under a U.S. backed military dictatorship. Honduran District Attorney Harry Dixon Herrera and Congressman Marvin Ponce believe that the timing of the coup is the key to understanding it. The planteamiento most más duro, que es lo que generó la irritación de la derecha hondureña y la derecha internacional, fue que el presidente planteara la idea de hacer una nueva constitución. Habida cuenta que la constitución vigente ha sido muy manoseada, muy manipulada por los sectores de poder político y se requiere un nuevo contrato social para construir un país bajo niveles de, más, de menos exclusión, de más democracia participativa, de más eh, eh, desarrollo humano. Y desde esa perspectiva, entonces, los grupos de poder económico plantearon que al, al verse despojados con una nueva constitución, se podían ver eh, afectados por la pérdida de los privilegios que tiene y que le genere el statu quo. In the days that followed the coup, Latin American leaders were unified in rejecting any negotiation with the coup government, demanding Celaya's immediate reinstatement. To the north, however, both Canada and the United States advocated negotiation with the same government that they claimed to not recognize as legitimate. The U.S. State Department sponsored negotiations in Costa Rica. And while they pledged neutrality, a senior official speaking under anonymity to the Associated Press on July 7th before the negotiations even began, said that a good compromise would be the return to power of Celaya in exchange for an agreement to drop any plan to poll the Honduran people on forming a constitutional assembly. The State Department has refrained from punishing the coup government, and only now that Micheletti has turned down a proposal that would have seen the popular poll abolished has the State Department changed its tone. That uh, Mr. Micheletti, de facto regime, needs to take this mediation effort seriously and respond uh, appropriately. Uh, should that not happen, uh, there are clear consequences uh, with regard to uh, our, our assistance to Honduras. But it's not only local and U.S. elites that appear to fear popular participation in Honduras. 
when the Organization of American States voted 33 to 0 to expel Honduras from the organization, Canadian Foreign Minister for the Americas, Peter Kent, was the only person in the room to vocally oppose the plan for Celaya to return to Honduras immediately. For the moment, the time is not right for the return of President Zelaya to Honduras, uh, that it is far from clear um, that current conditions could guarantee his safety upon return. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's likely, however, that Kent had more on his mind than Zelaya's personal safety when he spoke up that night. There are three lucrative industrial gold mining projects currently active in Honduras, all of which are owned and operated by Canadian corporations. The Real News spoke to Graham Russell, co-director of Rights Action, a Canadian non-profit that, amongst other things, supports communities in Honduras and Guatemala that are home to mines owned by Canadian mining giant Gold Corp. Graham spoke to us from Toronto, Canada, upon his return from three weeks in Honduras. There's a, a, a direct relationship between the Canadian government and the mining industry before any of this happened. I mean, we've been working on the Gold Corp stories for years, and the, there's no Canadian embassy in Honduras. The, 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 it's the embassy in Guatemala that covers Guatemala and Honduras. The Canadian embassy in Guatemala has been outright almost like a PR office for mining. The problems go from A to Z. So you, you, you begin with the lack of democracy, the lack of rule of law, the lack of consultation, and the lack of getting consent from the affected communities. No one at the local community that are being affected by mining knew about the fact that concessions were giving, being given out, given out to, to mining companies. They don't really know anything about what's going on until it's too late. So then they start opposing mining because um, rights started getting violated, people start protesting, and then there's repression. In the case of Guatemala, a number of people have been, been killed in protests, a number of people have been wounded. In the case of uh, Honduras, it was never quite so serious in terms of killing people, but then there's death threats against the community leaders. And then meanwhile, once the mining starts, then you just get into this endless list of health and environmental harms, because this type of open pit mining means that they literally blow up mountains, entire mountains, crush them into bits, and then put them all in a pile and soak them with cyanide until the, the cyanide attaches to the gold and leaches out. But that whole process of blowing up the mountain releases heavy metals into the air, earth, and water in really unhealthy quantities, mercury, arsenic, and lead. So you've got this whole combination of water depletion because they're drying up rivers and underwater aquifers for the mining, for the plant and the processing plant of the gold. And then you've got the release of the contaminants. All of this leads to health harms. And so you've got um, a whole series of skin diseases that ultimately have to do with blood contamination. People initially thought that they were superficial skin diseases, but then there were recurring skin problems and hair loss and, 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 and skin, skin problems in, the, in people's heads and all over their bodies and legs. Nos están destruyendo. Y es cierto que antes vivíamos pobres, pero, pero sanos, y ahora pobres y enfermos. President Zelaya's government, that in my view did little or nothing, to properly regulate or rein in Gold Corp's um, mining operation in the Syria Valley. But he did say that he was putting a moratorium on giving out any more mining concessions for exploration or exploitation, and that he was going to um, push for a complete mining law reform. Why do they permit that people who are strange come to kill us here, a little bit? Because for them, we don't have anything. Gold Corps is one of many businesses in Honduras that have been accused of hiring poor Hondurans to attend protests in support of the coup government. It's a pretty simple operation and it's very common with different businesses and institutions throughout Honduras. And basically what we learned is that like is happening across the country, the, the company, they send out a point person in the community. And these are close-knit communities so everyone knows everyone and they would just... Uh, a well-known person in the community who has worked for the company in the past or works for the company now or who has worked as um, a mining promoter for the local municipality that's in favor of the mining company just approaches people one by one says hey you want to earn 400 lempiras which is like 20 US dollars sure why how tomorrow be at 8 o'clock on at such and such a corner of the dirt road that goes to the region bus will pick you up we drive you to town 
There'll be a pro-coup um, regime protest. They obviously don't call them pro-coup regime protests. They call them pro-democracy and peace protests. And all we do is we want you to go there. We'll drive you there. You put on this T-shirt. They give them these white T-shirts that, that are for the movement for peace and democracy. And just stay in, stay in the in the in the protest area. When they say hoot and holler pro democracy, just hoot and holler and say pro democracy. And then the bus comes back at three o'clock. So be on the bus at three o'clock. We drive you back here. It's about an hour and a half drive, depending on traffic. And then they drop them off on the same dirt road near near to their home community. The whole fear, in my opinion, of the powerful sectors in Honduras, with respect to President Zelaya's government and the fact that he was, you know, supporting the people's right to vote on whether they would have a national constituent assembly or not is less the written letter of the law and by far much more the empowerment process that the people would go through. There's enough law in the country that if it were properly applied, it wouldn't have been a perfect situation, but there's no way Gold Corp could have carried out the mining the way it's carried out the mining. And the reason it carries out the mining that way is not because people are ignorant of the law and it's not because they're indifferent to the law, it's because of the impunity of the powerful sectors. And the the laws do not get applied. And the, the, the political commissions that exist within the Congress do not do their job to demand oversight. And then bringing it back to the broader picture of, of even part of the reasons why the coup was carried out, in my opinion, is not so much the written letter of the law that needs changing in Honduras, but the, the massive outpouring of participation and empowerment that will take place when the people start to participate in this process.